So you don't have to hide, man. I was, I was about to say, let's go smurf that smurf that. Yeah, she's such a smurf. Oh, you've yeah. seen it too. <laughs> Everybody, welcome to the Quackcast. This is Quackcast number four hundred and two. I'm Ozone Ocean. This is the Drunk Duck Quackcast. With me is the amazing Tan Serene. Hi, Tans. Hello. There's the amazing Pit. Hello, Pit Face. Hmm. <laughs> He's judging everyone. Cat woman. <laughs> and then there's Bunny Baines. Hello, Bunny Baines. Hello. <laughs> do you know what sound a bunny rabbit makes do they make a sound is oh it... yeah just wiggling their little noses no. they say here's your coffee Mr. Hugh <laughs> <laughs> they say yeah what's up doc <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no no bun- rabbits that I have at least that I have had they make sounds like this they go mm, 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 mm. they grunt a lot so, yeah, that's, <laughs> oh. that's the sound the rabbit makes. They're little monsters. Wow. So, uh, that's not what we're talking about in this quack cast. This quack cast is going to be about reader expectations and does the author owe the reader or the audience particular characters? And, you know, should we feel like we should cater to audience whims? And, well, you know, we'll, we'll weigh in on that. So. Reader expectations and, and owing readers a certain type of character. First, before we get into that, I'll have to do the quack uh, cast. Not quack cast. I'll have to mention the featured comic. Kwai the Gakso came up with that. And this week's one is Muscle Corpse. So tell us about that, Kwai. Tell us about Muscle Corps. Hello, this is Kwai Degakse, and the feature I've selected for this week is The Muscle Core by Brainspace Comics, and it is rated E for everyone. There is an unidentified teenager on the loose stealing paint, spraying fresh graffiti in the wall, hurting people, and drinking booze. This behavior needs to be stopped by the best group the city has to fight vigilantes. The Muscle Corps watches this unique group of positive crime fighters, Tightwire, Beacon, Mega Jaw, Goat, Boy Dracula, and Genius Bot make an effort to stop the spread of petty crime in the city. The art is digitally drawn and in full color. Take a bite out of city crime and read Muscle Core by Brain Space Comics. Rated And that was the featured comic. Muscle Corps. Or is it Muscle Core? I'm not sure. See, I think Muscle Corps. I would read a comic called Muscle Corps. If it's Muscle Core, <laughs> then. Well, that's, that's a genre. new thing. Yeah. yeah, build up your that core. Happen. So after Muscle Core, we've got to talk about the featured music. And Gun Wallace has given us this feature to Frog Tree Comics. Frog Tree, which is, of course, the comic by Scream. Beautiful, beautiful Scream. Attractive, uh-huh. attractive beautiful fellow that he is. Um, Lovely summer child. <laughs> He's a wizard of those comics, man. He is. Oh, yeah. Go well, check it out now before it's gone, man. Scream takes yes, his boy. he's a god. <laughs> what a fleeting yeah. one. Yeah. So, Frog Tree Comics slip into the shadowy club, slide into a booth, and watch the action on the dance floor. Quiet, subdued disco. This track wants to party, but not be too obvious about it till it gets up the courage to join the throng and strut its stuff. So, take it away, Gun Wallace, with Frog Tree Comics. <laughs> <laughs>
And that was our featured music. Gun Wallace, thank you very much for that. Frog Tree Comics, which is a comic by Scream, and it's rated E for excellent. So, character expectations, and do they owe us a character? Does a writer owe the reader a particular character or the creator of a, like a movie or, or a TV show or whatever? You know, do they owe us a particular character? I say yes, they do, and they're bastards when they, they don't. So, I'll, I'll be. I say. <laughs> I, th- I think it depends on, as a writer, what you're going for. Who are you looking to please? Are you writing to please yourself or are you writing to please your audience? And then that'll give you the answer. If you want to please your Aussie audience, give them what they would expect in a character. And if you want to please your audience, ask me and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you're the only audience that matters, Oz. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, it, it can be the, like, say, if you want to make money as a writer, do you try extra hard to please your audience and give them what they want? There's that well, as a thing. I think. I think whatever everything should come in moderation. I mean, <coughs> the audience will like what you like to a big extent because yeah. theoretically it's going to be presented in a way uh, that is very fitting to the story that you are presenting. So they're going to go with it. Um, if you try to be super formulaic to please them by giving them what is super established to be a crowd pleaser you might get the opposite effect and bore them because they expect mm-hmm. everything and, and yeah. they don't come to be coddled they come to be entertained so Absolutely. or at least uh, interested not necessarily entertained, but interested and engaged and have an experience, whatever that means. You can tell yeah. when somebody is very much, like when their goal is very much to please an audience. And it usually, nine times out of ten, I would dare say, comes across as very blatant. And the thing is, all right, so may, maybe I'm being a little bit too black and white with that, but it's, it's really noticeable. Especially if you have been reading and watching things for a long time. And I don't know. It's just, it just depends on what you want to go for, I guess. I I was rambling. I was going to say something, but I'm going to put myself on (laughs) mute for now. (laughs) (laughs) I'll come back when I have something worthwhile to say. So Pitt takes yourself into the corner. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, that was actually a very good day. Start of point. If I don't sneeze, I'm going to finish my sentence. Um, but the, the not but there's no but in this. Uh, the thing is that nine out of, times out of ten will backfire. Is that you force the story? If you want to specifically please your audience, you will end up inadvertently uh, forcing the story go through certain scenes or certain situations or certain um, uh, developments that perhaps wouldn't have happened normally. So you may need to to get a smart character, a a clever character to act really dumb for something to happen. Or you might need to get the villain to do something they wouldn't normally do, like spare some character that they would totally have immediately killed if they could. Mm. Um, So that lowers the the sincerity that you as a creator have to your own story. So it undermines more how much the audience is going to also take it seriously. And thus uh, keep themselves engaged and interested. So. Yeah, that that's a good point. Um, the other thing is, um, I think Bravo mentioned this in the, this particular thread that uh, that we're going from is you don't want to betray the audience either. So I. 
I think you, you were sort of uh, getting at that, that you, you want to sort of lead up to um, a character doing something and foreshadow what they're going to do rather than suddenly switch around suddenly and um, go in a completely different direction sometimes. That's what we can do with characters. So we have to, um, you know... Mm, you don't, you don't want to do it without uh, do well. What do you call it? Preparation. Mm -hmm. exactly. You can you can have those big changes with your character, but don't just do it like they'll never expect this. You know, mm -hmm. there's subverting expectations. There's different ways to do that. Like there's, I'm doing it again. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> there's something about doing it the right way versus the wrong way yeah and it's a, it's a, kind of tough to talk about right because it's like you feel it when you read or watch something that's done wrong and you just kind of you you put the story down or walk out of the theater feeling like what uh you, you're not feeling it you're not satisfied you're like you might have been surprised over the course of the story but it's like it didn't um, I mean, like you guys were saying, didn't set it up properly, didn't foreshadow things properly, and kind of did it in a way that is like didn't maybe deliver the the goods in terms of story in general or in terms of whatever genre of story you're looking at. Um, the setups weren't properly paid off, and uh, the you know the questions weren't properly answered. The shocks came too often or at the wrong place or with no, again, with no um, kind of foreshadowing mm -hmm. where you could read the story again and say, ah, like, you know, there, there are the clues. They were right mm -hmm. there. You know, that's, so then it, yeah, it's like you can watch it and then, ah, it justifies. I always talk, exactly. when we talk about this, I always talk about Shutter Island. Which, it's one of many examples, but that uh, Martin Scorsese movie where uh, I was watching it, really enjoying it, but there were a couple parts where I was like, ah, that's wrong. Like, it's like, ah. But then, like, mentally, I just brushed it aside right away because it's like, well, nothing's perfect. You know, it's like, okay, it's a little bit of bad writing or just it's just a little bit off. And then at the end of the movie, it's like, oh, my God, that, that thing I brushed aside, that was a clue to what was really going on. You know, and that's mm -hmm. awesome done so well yeah, that's that's awesome when it's happening and uh, um i would also like to to offer a comparison about this uh perverting expectations thing and how it can be done well and how it can be done dreadfully and of course you know what i'm getting at i think um because i want to compare a certain uh char two characters uh, one is from is a uh, zuko from the last airbender and the other one is of course uh, luke skywalker from the last time, that was coming. Yeah. Of course, <laughs> it's like it's it's. <laughs> actually, I'm I'm kind of thankful that the last Jedi is is that bad because <laughs> it had all the problems, all the problems that you might encounter as a creator, as a writer, gift wrapped in in one big compendium of of terror, and and mm -hmm. you can see what not to do in just one movie watch this and don't do that. So, right. but in, in, uh, in any case, what I was going to, I wanted to compare was like the uh, Zuko starts off as a villain and uh, spoiler alert, he ends up being, uh, turning, doing the full, the, the heel face turn and, and uh, joining the heroes in the end. And uh, they have, this is not the expectation that is subverted because if you are even a little bit experienced in these sort of stories, you can tell that this character cannot stay in the villainous side for too long. You you can see it happening by the, his motivations, why he's doing what he's doing, how he's doing it, and, and, and all sorts of things. But there is this masterful stroke in the middle of uh, the entire series, like of all three characters of it, uh, where you feel that this is the point where the guy is going to do this heel face turn, which is going to be triumphant and awesome, and it is built up in a perfect way. But they have already set up 
the guy's motivations, which is uh, to please his father, to be accepted as a son. And uh, this is the real issue that is driving him up to them. So his sister comes and offers that to him. Like, uh, stay with us. Don't uh, turn and go with the good guys. And mm. you are going to be everything you wanted. And he takes it. And nobody expects that. But it's very expectable at that point in the story. And uh, the, that's how you subvert expectations well. Because you have set up the base, the springboard or the switch that is going to do the subversion. And then you take attention away from it, but you leave it there and, and you subtly remind people that it's still there, it hasn't gone, but it's not the focus. So, all oh, right, it's not the big it happens. about ten yeah, you because, thought it was big. It, it's exactly, there, but... exactly. Um, and that's actually a terrible moment because uh, when everything is at stake and he shouldn't, he shouldn't um, stay with the villains, he should turn and go with the good guys and uh, give uh, the good guys a leg up in uh, the whole struggle. That's when he fails everybody. Mm -hmm. And he goes, because there is no way that he wouldn't as a character at that particular point. That's masterful. I, I really enjoyed I hated to see it, but I also really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. But you I, felt I, something and that and yes. you felt something that was memorable. See, so mm. I've watched the there's probably gonna be spoilers here. Just not really though, because people kind of go know what happens with She Ra and everything, but I watched the new She Ra series and later on in the series things get better, but where they <coughs> fail in my book is in the beginning where um when Adora who becomes Shira uh turns from the horde which are supposed to be the bad, the bad guys to the good guys um and it's like all right everybody knows that that's going to happen that it it's not a surprise that you're waiting for she's going to turn eventually but the thing is it's like so, so viewer expectation is that Adora would eventually, you know, turn face to the to the good guys. But the thing is, it's like they go through, they just kind of go through the motions of how she turns. It's like you don't really see her life beforehand. You don't really get to know who she is, except for a few lines of dialogue, like, "Oh, like she's in line to be horde captain" and stuff like that, and like, "Oh." She wants to do stuff, and she has a friend, and she <laughs> has this lady yeah, who's kind of been raiding, who's kind of been raising her. But other than that, like it's all almost told to you. You don't really experience it much outside of a few scenes. And then when it when it comes, and, and and granted, she's lived her whole life with this horde, but it takes one scene for her to turn on them. It takes one scene. It's like oh, you know, she's met these new people in this village gets attacked that she's at and all of a sudden she's like oh the horde's bad like how did you not know that this was going on your entire life and then what so when she makes this heel turn it's like you don't feel anything it's like yeah so this is the part in the story where she becomes a good guy okay mm -hmm. i'm not i'm it's, there's nothing here that's i i didn't know anybody it, it happens by the end of like the second episode and it's like and i feel like the the thing that went wrong here is that they had to kind of rush the story to get to a certain point by the end of the second episode. And um, so, you know, it would be established, but it's like, it would have been better if they would have perhaps taking the entire first series or first half of the, the first season, I mean, and built it up. I want to see, like, they have this amazing world at their fingertips that's a combination of technology and magic and all, and, and beautiful backdrop work and everything. And just, you see these creatures in these places and you want to know more about it. I don't want to just be dropped in the story and then, hey, here's she -Ra. let's go save the day. I want to, I wanted to have the time to get immersed properly in that world so when that time came that i was expecting where she would turn to the good guys it would mean something to me 
instead of just going through the pages and it didn't. And so later on in the series, things started to hit home. We're like, Oh, okay, here's this character. They have this going on and stuff like that. It's, it gets a little bit better, but by then it was just like, you should have taken the time to do this earlier. You know? Yeah. And there's this, uh, now that I haven't watched it, I I have to say that um, I wasn't, I, I was turned off very early from this, but that that's not the point. From what I hear, from what you're describing, if she was raised by this evil, evil lady or whatever, like if she, she has a mom that is evil, now kids have an, uh, a super glue connection to their mothers. Now it's it's uh, something that is uh, tremendously hard for a kid to sever this. Yeah. So if you don't have a focus on that, and that that cannot happen overnight. Like oh okay, now I'm going to turn on my evil mom. And I'm going to be with the good guys that I have just met. And, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Let's go. That doesn't happen. And, no, it and doesn't. It has lasting ramifications. Like, there may be, there should be trauma. There should be doubt. There should be... Uh, and uh, there are some things later on that kind of hint that maybe there's a little bit, there is a, not regret, but there is some friction but still not a lot like um like she like there's this one episode where like there's this whole thing going on and she starts to be paranoid that this mother figure is coming in after her and it kind of shakes her up a bit but it's still it's very much like what you were saying like it was it that was another thing that made it very unbelievable that she had been living with the horde all of her life and had this mother figure and then she just turned against them without like another question after one scene where a village was ransacked while they were trying to get her like to bring her back to the bad guys and so she has that one scene i don't know it's just like I said, yeah. it was that that was one of the things that made it unbelievable. There's just anyway. Yeah, and and, and I have to add uh, to this, uh, going back to the last airbender, when uh, Zuko actually does turn, the scene when he turns, after having gone through this, uh, oh, I'm almost with the good guys, but then I revert to being with the bad guys because the bad guys are upping their offer basically on what uh, to keep me. Um, uh, when he opts to go with the good guys it's very heartbreaking because he consciously gives up everything that he had uh, um, worked for basically and uh, and it's it's heartbreaking to see but it's also very triumphant and very oh. satisfactory uh, it makes it it makes it count it makes it important and you trust this character that this character has made the turn after a whole voyage and a, and a whole uh, growth in a sense that um, has uh, led him because he is inherently good whatever uh, his bad choices or whatever he has chosen very specifically very uh, independently even go with a good guys. It's not it's not like uh, you know being pushed by the story writers. It's not being pushed by the the winds of circumstance <laughs> or whatever. Mm. Uh, or it's not done just to please the audience. Or focus just on or, yeah. or in relevance to the audience. And then going to Star Wars Star Wars has this feel of you know what? We have gone through all the chat rooms ever anywhere. And whatever theory you have, we're subverting them all. Yeah, Suck we're going to be this. really clever. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. No. And, and of course, that cannot be the basis of horror story because there is no way to subvert everything and still have a normal story. Um, yeah. You can have a and, couple big surprises and something like that, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, to take almost every scene and have it a subversion is just yes. bizarre. 
bizarre experience. And of course, then uh, (laughs) Adel throws everything up exactly because of this. And and because it's not set up at all, you have had a whole movie where Luke is missing, but you don't focus in that movie as to the reasons. Nobody knows the reasons. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Come on. (laughs) You are supposed, there was this uh, uh, huge destruction that happened. There was Kylo Ren that ran away because his uh, uncle tried to murder him in his sleep. Uh, and there was this whole thing that nobody talks, there's no gossip in this world. Nobody talks about this. Nobody talks shit about Luke Skywalker bailing on them and, and doing this and, and uh, being a bad teacher and all these things that would be natural in interactions with people that have personalities. And it would also foreshadow why he would be the way he is when we actually get to meet him. We will have some basis to, to explain why he's being such a dick. When he, when mm. the last time we met him, he was your standard knight in shining armor that would go and put himself forward and do things and keep at them until he gets them, mm-hmm. which is what people were expecting to see. But you didn't undermine this enough so that they would accept a completely right. different character, basically. Yeah. So don't pander to your audience and don't punch your audience either. <laughs> don't punch your audience. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking on. I mean, you the... get. Yeah, go on. Well, I was thinking of that in terms of, you know, say say the, the topic is, um, is it right for the. Um, you know, do do you owe characters? Do you owe the audience in a particular character? Is it right for you to? And and one argument is, yeah, I'm the writer. Sure, I can do what I want. No, I don't owe you anything if you're going to read my thing. But there's there's a a valid reason why people feel betrayed, and why they feel pissed off when they're enjoying you know um, a book or a movie or a comic or whatever, and you you subvert the character you take the character in a direction they didn't want and that can point out bad writing as as we've just been talking about so you know it's yeah. there's a good reason I would it. say I would say I would say that the, the answer the straight answer straight answer whatever the direct answer to the question would be that you don't owe them any character but what you do owe them is a good story, like a soundly built story mm-hmm. for their time, because they are investing their time to read your thing. Mm. So give them something that is at least soundly built. In the same way that an architect may not owe you uh, five bathrooms, but you should at least have one. <laughs> and one that won't collapse in on you is the key or like the toilet won't like fall down <laughs> out through the floor yeah. while you're using it it, it <laughs> all it all comes back to what it usually comes back to be a decent writer which is e- always easier said than done hindsight is always twenty twenty, and it's like all right you know looking back at star wars um although i haven't seen that the the latest installments but it's like looking back, we can say, "Yeah, this doesn't work," you know. And the writer should have seen that this that this doesn't work. But yeah, that that's a good point. It's not just subverting characters, and um, it's it's writing them well <laughs> and not making stupid mistakes. The, it, the point think- isn't to subvert or not to subvert. If your first question is, do we subvert this or do we not subvert this? I mean, yeah, that could be a cool way to find a new premise for a story that you haven't written yet. But then you have to put some legs under that table. You can't just say, here's a subversion and there, there's the dressing around it. And you'll just have this. And that's what we'll go with. Exactly. Yeah. And um, the thing is that I think that I think that also added a nail in in the last movie's coffin in terms of uh, Star Wars was the marketing. The marketing was horrid because they started they started with this, like, we are going to subvert everything. 
we are going to to make it our way and uh, we're going to basically flip you off in every way there is <laughs> and, uh, oh, Tans, so, illustrate that please true. no because you <laughs> will probably you know screen capture this so no um, the, um, the, the, the thing is the thing is that when you start in this very aggressive and and it's not only aggressive it's it's hostile when you start addressing your audience in a hostile manner they are going to be defensive because they are not they are not there you shouldn't take them for granted basically and and they are not there to be abused as a writer as a creator you have a responsibility not to abuse your audience and that doesn't mean to treat them with kid gloves but it means kid gloves <laughs> sorry um, but the, that means that you should respect them and give them something that that is at least viable as a story uh, even if they don't like it and I, and I want to offer an example on this there is, a, there is this story Lately, that I have uh, lately finished uh, from a uh, Korean drama, which uh, involved the character, a, a specific character, uh, dying. Okay, and uh, you hate this because it's the one character that shouldn't die, like that. Oh. <laughs> uh, for various reasons. I'm not going to go into the story, but the, the idea is that uh, this character shouldn't... It's very unfair that he died and some other assholes lived. But the, the, the whole... <laughs> you can accept this because the story warrants it. You can see why this happened and a, a, a whole part of why the character died is his fault because he he should have learned not to do certain things and he didn't so you can understand why they allowed for this character to die although you hate it mm -hmm. so you don't actually okay. ha hate the story uh, you don't you say I'm I said I'm not watching this again but I can still say that it's a worthwhile story and I'm glad that I experienced it yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's done well. But, it's just, it's annoying, but it's not so annoying that um, it breaks the story. It still, no. it's, you you it's, want to slap yeah. the character and not the author, and that's the mm -hmm. difference. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> It's an important point for like people writing web comics and doing their own stuff. We we don't all, I mean, thankfully or not thankfully, you know, we don't have the weight of something like Star Wars that has so much expectation with characters we've seen before and a world we've seen before and stuff like that. Um, you you can kind of do whatever you want as a writer, so it's not like you can't be surprising or shocking or or heartbreaking or, or do anything you want or have your main character die or whatever. Um, but you set it up, you know, if, if it's set up and it feels like story or series and you, it's not forecasted literally, but it's like you feel it. It's like, it, it makes sense. The, you know, that there's a truth to it. Like the character, like you said, didn't learn what he needed to learn. And, you know, it's disappointing and heartbreaking when they die, maybe, but it, and shocking. But it's like, yeah, it's it not the fits. kind of thing that makes you go, OK, I'm not reading anything by this person again. or I'm not watching anything by this person again, yeah. which is, <laughs> you know, that's in that sense, you owe your readers. Your readers can be whoever you want, you know, like first and foremost yourself. You're your own re first best reader, you know, in, in of your own web comics kind of thing. So you can, you know cater it to what you like personally but once you begin that story um yeah you gotta uh you gotta watch it you gotta deliver on what you're setting up that's a good point you have to deliver yeah 
but you, luckily you can kind of decide what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Once you Once can still you be... put it out into the world, you have to yeah. um, carry on with your commitments. You, you've you made a commitment to an audience. So there's, there's like a exactly. deal. It's like a trade. And you're part of that now. It's not just for yourself anymore. So. Well, yeah. I, mean, I think Baines put it best just now, though I want to reiterate what he just kind of said, that you know, prepare what you make, you know, set it up, but you still decide ultimately what it is that you do deliver. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yep. you're, you're yeah. doing that, yeah. But and I'm thinking, uh, I us. want to give an example for, from uh, from Without Moonlight, and I don't think it's a spoiler anymore, it's been enough time. Uh, so when, uh, I, I decided to allow Basil to die. Uh, I could have as an author. He dies? Uh, what spared... the fuck? Oh my god. <laughs> he got he got squished by a tromper. Ah. Yes. <laughs> so, Bloody thing. Uh, more safe I, I, was, uh, I, I hated this because uh, he is my favorite character. And he will always be my favorite character out of all of them in Without Moonlight. But um, I thought to myself, okay, I can injure him and have him be, you know, rescued and he can survive and keep on. But it wouldn't make sense and it would detract of, of, the, of the weight, uh, of the threat that making one false move literally means death. You don't get a second chance. So uh, the fact that he he trusted too much when he shouldn't have, although he's naturally not trusting, he was, but he he dropped his guard when he shouldn't have, and that was fatal. Um, I think that this, and, and I decided, okay, I have to let him go because then that that showed. Two things. First of all, that uh, Arthur is not a Stormtrooper Academy uh, graduate in terms of <laughs> shooting. He actually can get his uh, target, uh, which uh, I think would be more realistic because he had the time to aim and uh, take the shot. Uh, so that was one thing. And uh, the other thing is that the stakes are high enough that people take seriously the smallest of of judgment calls right in this situation and and the permanence of some judgment calls uh, it's not as easy to get a second chance sometimes you will but you don't know when and um yeah, so you don't Most take people stuff didn't expect. Yeah, most people didn't expect uh, Basil to die because he was uh, he was uh, clearly yeah, someone I really liked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you can tell right that he did when it happened. Yes, so I didn't get flack in the sense of how dare you now I will blacklist you and uh, never read you again and blah 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 blah. It's, uh, I never got this. I, I I got people just being shocked that it happened and and still following with the story. Yeah, because we're we're expecting him to That's come good. alive, you know, like it was a body double or you know, it was still <laughs> <hopes>. his evil <laughs> twin. He, he will uh, come back as a zombie to <laughs> avenge him. <laughs> yeah, well, Sorry, yeah. Spoiler: uh, He comes back and uh, he just uh, touches through. Uh, the Gestapo building and uh, <laughs> he and, turns uh, everybody and that's, yes, the, that's how everybody. World War 2 was won in the end exactly <laughs> and that's how this was liberated by the zombie battle <laughs> <laughs> the great zombie battle of, oh jeez that should be in the history books yeah <laughs> but yeah yeah that that kind of thing is 
Well, it can be fun to subvert reader expectations as long as you don't, you know, do it in a Star Wars way. If if mm-hmm. you do it in a way that is appropriate to the characters and yeah, doesn't doesn't piss them off, it can be fun because you did something they didn't expect and you get an, a reaction. And as an author, you love to get a reaction from your work and you love people reacting yeah. to it. So that's a that's a pleasant feeling. Mm-hmm. So we we like doing that, but we don't like um, betraying our readers. Yeah, that's the worst. And and you have to keep in mind that at some point they will see something coming, and that thing will come because that's how the story is set up to progress, and that's fine. It's fine if, if your audience can tell where you're going with something. Of course, yeah, it's it's not wrong that people guess. Um, you know, tra- tra- trajectories and, and plot points because some are going to guess and most aren't, hopefully. So, yeah, <laughs> who cares? The The whole point of being an author isn't to trick your, your audience. And going back to the owing uh, the audience a character, if they expect the story warrants a character to develop in a certain trajectory, let them have it. Because the story warrants it. They're not supposed to completely, you know, force them, shoehorn them or, or or stuff them into a mold that doesn't fit. Just to be edgy. Just to be edgy. The unpredictable yeah. the unpredictable yeah. author that will surprise you. you know? <laughs> what, twist? what a twist. Sorry what a think. twist. <laughs> what a twist. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows which direction Pinky's going because I don't really know which direction. So she's a bit of a loose cannon. <laughs> It'll be the biggest surprise to you most of all. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> I've got no freaking idea. Actually, I was I was doing a model shoot with a um a, this this girl who was uh, cosplaying uh, Pinky on Friday. And she's asking, so how am I going? How do I play the character? You know, what what should what things do I do? And I'm thinking, you know, I really don't know. <laughs> how does Pinky, you know, act? What what are appropriate things for Pinky to do apart from being pissed off all the time? Because <laughs> Pinky doesn't doesn't do things in a character way. Pinky does things in more of a um, often like um just reacting to people and and doing things more naturalistically so it's it's hard to think of her as like you know like a superhero character was defined by certain things they do so yeah oh sorry for that uh, tangent but yeah that was an interesting aside but yeah uh reader expectations i haven't betrayed my readers very much i think in in the way my characters behave because I don't think they have too many expectations. So I'm pretty good on that score. I can't recall any times any of us really have, but I don't know. I'm an unfeeling mass of flesh, so I'm not a proper gauge for how people regularly gauge things. Well, we would be upset if Bones acted in a way that's contrary to how we have expected him to be, I think. I think. Well, of yeah. course you would. Yeah, yeah. So we 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 love Bones being like the the taciturn kind of fellow that he is, and if Bones suddenly became, I don't know, um, like Exus, then it would be just, oh my god, what have you done? That's <laughs> that's that's not him. That's, that's that's not him at all. So that would be um, a betrayal. That's that's but you have that's done that. that's of course, but you know that. What, what was what? that? Uh, that's, uh, you are saying this because you are anti-capitalist and anti-totalitarian or whatever. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, jeez. Yeah, I want to see how Exus turns into that. But that, that's another, that's the thing for another another time. Um, that's, a, that's, also, that's another thing. If you promise your audience that something that they cannot understand why it's there, it's going to be explained. They're going to give you the time to give them the answer. Like, uh, yeah. like um, for example, like let's take the Sira example. 
if you, they could even have started with her being Sira or having just begun, become Sira mm -hmm. and and actually promised the audience with nuances and scenes that they would explain how she came to turn and, and, and what that entails for her and the stakes and everything. And I think people would be just fine yeah. with just starting off with Sira having turned and being now the good guy. And uh, we are going to learn all about it as we go along and with the interaction that she's going to have with all the other characters. Yeah, 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 exactly. We we would have been fine with that, although I just that's not something I'm gonna get into myself, but yeah. <laughs> From a storytelling perspective, yeah. anyway. Shira. Oh jeez. <laughs> I love that old cartoon. <laughs> yeah, that um like for example I'm thinking and I'm going to stop with that one and I'm not going to Flamox you all with a ton of Korean shows, but um, there is one that uh, is, I very, very, I hold in very high regard, and it's called Mr. Sunshine, and it's a historical um, drama, uh, very, very historically accurate in many ways, um, it has very much a without moonlight feel, so of course, oh. I'm uh, very enamored with it. Uh, so it starts off with this character that comes like it's, he's a Korean, but he's actually he was born Korean, but he is American, and he returns uh, with a posse of uh, of soldiers, and he is very cold to everything Korean, and you have no idea why. Or okay, you get a hint in the beginning, but let's say that you don't know that it's him. Uh, because you see him as a small child in the beginning. Um, and it's it's super intriguing because you want to see why this this fellow, how he, did he end up being American uh, in that era? Because we're talking about uh, 1860s, more or less. Um, how this uh, 1870s, and how this guy came to be Korean, uh, American, and what is his issue with okay. Koreans and yeah. yeah and Korea in general and, and how did he end up and what does that mean about other characters that we root for that are Korean and they don't like the Americans there and stuff like that so it's super super intriguing and uh, they don't tell you what happened immediately they let you discover it along with other characters and with flashbacks and stuff like that. And, and it's so engaging and so viscerally given that, uh, and there are a lot of subversions in it, in that you expect certain things, but then you get some piece of information that changes the picture in completely about certain things. And uh, you love it when it happens mm -hmm. because, it, because it doesn't take you out of the story. It just immerses you even more in it. Yeah, yeah, it brings yeah. new color to it. Highly recommended, guys. It, uh, and it treats uh, it treats the representation of America very well as well. So don't worry about that. <laughs> um, you would enjoy it. Good. All right. Um, all right. A, a thing I watched recently that subverted character expectations in the first episode um, was this uh, anime that I started watching called, I think it was called Goblin Hunter or Goblin Slayer or something like that Goblin Slayer Goblin Slayer, yeah and so it starts off with like these like typical fantasy setting, like in anime fantasy, so people going to join like a guild adventurers <laughs> And then going to go off and like do quests and stuff like that. So there's this nervous little priestess character and she's not sure what she should do. And she's got the cutesy little voice that I hate. And these uh, plucky little adventurers say, <laughs> yeah, why don't you come and come with us? And oh, let's do an easy quest. Oh, let's hunt goblins. And so that's going to be like, you know, the typical kind of party. So you've got the fighter and the 
and a magician and uh, um, like a knight and she's going to be the healing priestess and they're going to go on and, and everything's going to be fine and so they go into this cave and hunting goblins and things are sort of working all right and then suddenly like things starts going super super badly and the goblins overwhelm them and just awful i'm not even gonna say what happens because it's really really awful it's horrible and yeah it's it's pretty pretty brutal and that's that completely subverted my expectations about those characters and what was going to happen to them and so much so that i was about to i was about to turn it off and not watch any more of the episodes because it was so brutal rather rather than that like subverting my expectations it was the fact that it was just so violent that i really it yeah i didn't want to see anymore but i continued watching it because it was such a, a, a um uh it was a unique thing because it had done things like anime doesn't typically do so it sort of went in and it rewards the 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 audience in that it's not sort of just rehashing the same formula it's just taking a completely different take on the formula and it doesn't fortunately the later episodes the episodes after the first one aren't as horribly brutal which is good but yeah so that was that was an interesting one it had subverted absolutely what i expected and that's that added to the brutality of the moment because you didn't expect them to do that to the characters you know the, the plucky kind of warrior kind of characters so and did you end up liking it like this uh, since you're talking about it I'm, I'm guessing like you kept watching and it uh... well i i respect it because it it's just you know takes a tack on on fantasy that you don't normally see in an in anime like it's um it's all set around this uh high level character that only hunts low level monsters he only hunts goblins because he psychopathically hates them because of what they did to his family so that's all he hunts and he you know he doesn't go after dragons or anything like that he's just goblins he's going yeah you gotta kill the children you gotta get them you gotta root them out you gotta (laughs) you gotta go after them you you have to get like short knives because you can't swing a sword in a cave. There's not enough room. You gotta get fire. You gotta burn them out. You gotta do this, and he's like totally specialized, and that's so weird in a, a fantasy thing. It's always yes, we have to get the dragon and the next biggest monster, and go for the next biggest one. But no, this guy says no. It's goblins. That's all that matters. I don't care about anything else. I don't even know what an ogre is. What's an ogre? Who knows? <laughs> I only care about goblins. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's worth watching because of that. Yeah, but um the brutality okay. almost made me not watch it anymore because that was yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we're yeah. sort of uh, at at at, uh, at our time now. You guys got anything extra or should we bounce away? Uh, yeah, that's pretty mm-hmm. good. Good topic, man. Yeah. Thanks, Absolutely. Mux Monsters, for um, inspiring us. All right, that's been Quackcast yep. 402. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye.